Hello. Welcome to the third video in this series on effective world language instruction. The first video dealt with the destructive impact of exposing our students too early, prematurely exposing them to the written word uh, as a means of conveying meaning to them. Uh, I talked about how that develops within the student an unwieldy five-step thought process as opposed to the two-step process in which a native speaker thinks. And uh, it also opens them up to inauthentic pronunciation as they in inevitably employ the, the English uh, phonics system to this new language that they're seeing in written form uh, for the first time. In the second video, I talked about a solution to this problem, a solution to the problem of text-based instruction that causes our students to speak in a slow, awkward, uh, stilted fashion. And that solution, which I proposed, I call it the natural language acquisition sequence. And it has to do, uh, there's an eight-step process, and you can look at the second video for the details. But the general idea is you're moving from uh, the level of an oral foundation that you've laid to uh, phonics, phonics instruction, to reading, and much later to writing. But first, within a very a limited scope of vocabulary and, and uh, grammatical structures, uh, you're laying a strong oral foundation with no exposure whatsoever to the written word so that when the students arrive uh, at the study of phonics, there is no potential for them to be engaging, and, and, and reading as well, there's no potential for them to be engaging uh, in uh, translation, in inner translation, nor is there the potential of them applying their native uh, uh, phonics system to this new language. Uh, and, and so, as I through the midst of these two different uh, videos that I've presented, I've um, I've used the term relative oral fluency uh, on several occasions, and I've yet to define what I mean by that. Now, it's a key concept because relative oral fluency I see as the watershed moment when our students. Uh, uh, are no longer thinking in their native language as they express themselves, again, within that limited context of vocabulary and structures to which they've been exposed. Uh, they're, they're thinking in the target language, they're speaking in the target language in that des desired two-step thought process. Uh, and at this point, it is finally safe for the teacher to expose them to the written word without any fear of, of uh, uh, compromising that thought process that the teacher has so painstakingly laid out. Um, Maybe you're not convinced necessarily yet about uh, the destructive nature of uh, exposing uh, students to the written word too early. Let me give you a couple of anecdotal uh, examples here from email that I've received from former students of mine over the course of the last year. These both are students who are teaching English overseas. Um, and let me just read their emails to you and then I'll co comment on their own observations of the kind of students that they inherited and had to work with namely students who themselves had received a text-based instruction uh, in, in their earliest stages of language learning and the consequences that that, that uh, wrought in their uh, ability thereafter to, to uh, pursue fluency. The first one wrote, Last month I spent a few weeks in a high school in a remote town in southwest China, near the border of Laos, teaching English as a volunteer to around 60 Chinese high school students there. The students barely spoke any English and disliked the subject because for them it was mainly useless memorization and grammar. While they had lists of medium level English vocabulary memorized, they had no idea how to use them in sentences. As I was planning my lessons there, I knew that I mustn't continue to teach the students useless English and at least help them love learning English and see its purpose during the short time I was there. So I reflected upon how you taught us French and basically borrowed your methods of teaching languages in a way that people would learn their first language. I used pictures and videos instead of Chinese translation, had an English and sign language only rule, focused on conversational English instead of vocabulary and spelling, encouraging them to talk even if they mess up the grammar, and occasionally played games that allowed them to practice what they had learned. The students loved this teaching method, and I saw them improving so much. Originally shy students who became so embarrassed when called upon because they could only speak separate English words, by the time we left, they were able to introduce themselves, talk about the weather, greet others, and make easy conversation in English confidently. 
Without your class and your influence, I definitely wouldn't have come up with so many teaching ideas and methods, and the students I taught would not have improved so much. Well, of course, I'm, I'm gratified by her encouraging remarks regarding the methods that she experienced in my own French classroom, but I'd like to focus more on what her email has to say and what we can infer from some of the comments she makes regarding the prior training these students have received uh, in, their, in their, their very discouraging state as she inherited them. She said that the English lessons had previously been composed of useless memorization and grammar. Uh, by, by grammar, I think she means analytical grammar studies in the forms of charts and, and rules, and, and that was the primary focus. She mentioned also that students had memorized lists of medium-level English vocabulary, and undoubtedly these lists, of course, were in written form, in text-based form, probably providing translations into Chinese as well but that they had no idea how to use these words and sentences. And then uh, thirdly, she said that students could only speak separate. And by separate, I think she means individual or discrete English words, probably coming from those lists of printed vocabulary. Well, in all three cases, the picture we get is of their initial instruction having been based on, on memorized lists, memorized printed lists, by the way, translation and analytical grammar studies. Very significantly, note that she used the word useless on two occasions. You're going to hear that again in the next email in describing their, pr their prior learning. Well, a second student of mine who was also studying, or teaching, I should say, overseas, uh, he wrote me the following. And he, he wrote to me as he was asking for access to my online world language program at theulant.com. He wrote, I'm really searching for a, a more engaging and useful way to teach English to my students. Most students here study English for several years with the only results being the ability to complete a worksheet. Just stop for a second. This is not an overseas problem. Uh, if, if you consider what degree, what percentage of American world language instruction involves the simple giving to the student of a grammar packet to complete as though that were sufficient uh, as far as their language training is, were concerned. Um, providing a student with a grammar packet uh, a, a worksheet or a series of worksheets to complete before the, the oral foundation has been laid to the learning only reinforces the problems uh, uh, which are going to keep them, impede them from ever speaking the language fluently. But l let's continue it with, this, uh, with this email. Here's the next part. He writes, I have given my grammar class worksheets which they can complete flawlessly. When I read to them what they just wrote, they cannot understand, however. I really wish more for my students because the current language that they're learning is useless outside of the high school classroom in this country. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Ironic to hear this uh, word useless used for the, the third time by these young teachers trying to teach English overseas. Might that not correspond to the sense of futility that many, uh, many world language students here in the United States feel as they recognize that they're jumping through hoops in order to attain a certain grade or to uh, satisfy a high school requirement for language study, but they're fully aware at the same time that they're absolutely incapable of speaking this language, actually speaking this language that they've been studying for two or three years. What these students overseas have acquired and what the case what is the case with many, many if not most American students is they've acquired a useless form of knowledge of a, a second language. They don't necessarily know why they have. They would tend to say, I don't have a very good teacher. It has nothing to do with their teacher being good or not good. The, the issue is that the teacher has been employing a failed traditional model of world language instruction. That is to say, instruction which reposes on the basis of, reposes on the foundation of, of text-based instruction, a premature exposure of the student to the written language, to written requirements, to written text. Um, and, and so, we, we get to the question, um, when is that watershed moment, that key moment, when it is safe for a teacher to expose students to the written word? In other words, what is, on the basis of what I've been putting forth in the first two videos, what is relative oral fluency? How can we recognize when it's in place, when it's safe to move to the printed word? When the providing of, of uh, phonics instruction and then reading instruction and finally, uh, uh, instruction in writing the language is the appropriate next step to take. Well, I'd like to get to the answer to that question kind of in a backdoor method 
we're going to look first at, at how does one measure oral fluency in a student. What is the, the, uh, the means by which we can know confidently that our students have attained what I will later define as relative oral fluency. What is the instrument we will use to measure the degree of their fluency? Well, back in 1980, when I decided that I needed to totally uh, overhaul the, uh, uh, the manner in which I was teaching uh, a world language, I needed to totally throw out all that I'd assumed was true and necessary about world language uh, instruction and come up with an approach that made sense if I wanted to train students to think the way in which a native speaker thinks when he or she speaks uh, 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 the native language. I knew that um, I needed to find a, a means of measuring oral expression because I was going to start with the skills of listening and speaking and exclusively with, with those skills for an extended period of time. You know, th there are different levels uh, of difficulty uh, regarding uh, the kinds of oral uh, expression that we perform. The lowest level is the ability simply to say yes or no, uh, uh, si or no, oui ou non, to a question that's posed to us. The, the second level of difficulty, uh, slightly more difficult, is to respond to such a question with a single word. The third level would be to respond to a question uh, with um, a complete sentence. And there are many, many levels of difficulty, I'm sure, but the maximum that I really wanted to hit, the summit of what I wanted to attain with my students, was their ability on their part to um, extemporaneously, these, these two words are very important, extemporaneously and spontaneously, extemporaneously without any any uh, reference or recourse to written notes and spontaneously without having specifically prepared for the speech that's about to transpire. I wanted them to be able to string together sentences to speak at length, much like I had to do when I would speak to my baseball players in France and give them a pep talk or talk to the like I mentioned in the first video, the parents of these baseball players and give them an inspirational talk to try and motivate them to spend time with their sons, get involved in their sons' lives. Or like when I would preach in church and, and speak for 25 or 30 minutes nonstop to native speakers of French. I wanted my students to, to gradually acquire that same ability to speak for five, two, five, ten minutes at a time uh, uh, in, a, in an extemporaneous and spontaneous manner. And so I, I recognized that um, I needed to come up with a system which would allow me to measure their speech, to transcribe their speech and to uh, quantify it and also in a qualitative manner determine the degree of accuracy, structural accuracy in their speech. I couldn't engage simply in guesswork. I think we too often fall into the trap of wishful thinking. Well, I, I think my students are understanding me. I think my students can speak fairly well. I think my students are thinking in the target language. Now we need a, a, a tool that allows us, something more specific than a rubric, a tool that allows us to very um, objectively and accurately quantify their fluency and measure the structural accuracy of their expressions. And so I came up with a system that I'd like to lay out uh, before you. Um, I, I needed to measure, as I mentioned, fluency and structural accuracy. So I created this tool, which I call the Speech Transcription and Evaluation Tool, um, uh, to provide me with the data that I was looking for to determine when my students have attained, as far as I can determine, uh, relative oral fluency, when it's time for me to move from the spoken language into um, uh, phonics, phonics instruction, reading instruction, and far later, uh, writing instruction. Um, I'd like to show you right now where it's located within my website, in case you'd like to uh, adopt it for your own. But I also want to emphasize, very, very important, that this is my method. Um, you very well may want to come up with something far less complicated, um, uh, which you find uh, user-friendly. The key is that you must have some system, something that gives you objective data and not merely, um, not merely engaging in, in wishful thinking. So here's where it's located. From my website, which is www.theulet.com, you go to teachers section. In essence, it's a teacher's manual. There you'll see three different sections. The first section involves these particular uh, videos that you're currently watching, Insights into World Language Education. The second section, which is by far the longest, deals with using the ULAT World Language Program. And then the third section is where you want to look for this particular tool. Under Teacher Resources, the second item is the Speech Transcription and Evaluation Tool. If you click on this button here, it'll take you to, um, to the system I'm about, about to describe to you very rapidly. 
Now, I said I was I'm going to describe this uh, 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 speech transcription and evaluation tool very rapidly because you'd find it tedious if I read through all the details. It's relatively complicated. And uh, you can find all of this described in great detail, as I mentioned, on my website. And you can read it. If you want to adopt my system, uh, you can read it all, all the details uh, on your own at another time. I just want to at least describe for you the different stages of, uh, of uh, creation I had to go through in order to make this system so that you yourself would know what, what things you should take into consideration if you want to try and build your own system. First, I, I had to come up with symbols that would represent different uh, sentence parts or elements of speech. Um, I needed a symbol that would indicate what, uh, a, a personal pronoun and a correctly conjugated verb, for example, or a personal pronoun, a conjugated verb followed by an infinitive, or a um, personal pronoun followed by a reflexive verb with the uh, correct or incorrect uh, personal uh, reflexive pronoun. Um, other symbols needed to represent uh, a, a portion of a sentence which contained at least three words and yet which did not contain a subject and a, and a verb. Uh, most common example of that would be a prepositional phrase, etc. So you can see the list of the different symbols I came up with here. And I needed to, to incorporate symbols also that indicated when a major or minor error in, uh, in, in grammar had been uh, committed as well. Well, the second uh, step uh, in my process was to assign what I call fluency points to these different statements. When I refer to fluency, I'm talking about the sheer quantity of information, whether it be accurately or inaccurately structured, the sheer quantity of information that a student is able to communicate within a, a particular period of time. And uh, so I gave each of the symbols a different point value, as you can see here. And it won't mean much to you unless you go back and see what each of these individual symbols means, but that's for another time uh, if you'd like to study I'm at my website the particular system that I've created. Thirdly, I needed to make allowance within my grading system for the frequency of structural errors in their speech. So I, I did have a, a means, along by means of this point value, of measuring the sheer quantity of information the students were conveying to me within a limited period of time. However, I needed also, I wanted my students not just to speak fluently, but to speak uh, coherently um, in a fashion which is relatively grammatically correct. And so I, I had to come up with a means of integrating into that uh, uh, those fluency points, a uh, means of deducting uh, from their score for the, the errors that they uh, that they per performed in the midst of their talk. And by the way, I would make as you can see, I made those uh, uh, the points deducted for errors uh, depend upon the duration of the talk. A much longer talk, less uh, would be deducted, of course, for uh, per error. Uh, you can take a look at a sample sentence here where you can see how these particular uh, symbols correspond to the elements in the sentence. Uh, and uh, down below you can also see a, a place where I, in addition to recording the, the symbols that correspond to their speech, I inscribed in abbreviated form above the, uh, above the mistakes the, uh, some kind of a, uh, a, a clue to remind me of what the mistake was so when the student would, would finish his or her talk, I could provide corrections about specific mistakes that the students made. Now, very important. All of this uh, notation that I'm doing, this transcription, as well as the noting of the specific mistakes, I'm doing in real time. You can imagine that acquiring this transcription skill uh, is nothing which happens immediately. It takes practice. It takes practice, uh, but once you've mastered the, the skill, uh, it's, it's just the most tremendous uh, uh, tool at your disposal um, when your students give extended talks. Uh, over a, a two or five or ten min, minute period of time. Now, about relative oral fluency. Through observing my students and, and discerning when they were speaking without any reflection in their native language, I was able to determine that a student had attained what I refer to as relative oral fluency if they could speak extemporaneously, no written notes, spontaneously, no prior preparation for their talk, at a rate of 25 fluency points, based upon my system of course, per minute for at least two minutes.
I came up with that that um, that figure because I looked at uh, the the rate of fluency of people whom I knew were not speaking uh, by means of inner translation, either measuring my own speech or measuring the speech of native speakers of a language. Um, of, of course, I wasn't looking for uh, the speech of native speakers speaking at a rapid rate so rapid that they were using slang and slurring words together. No. I wanted to measure uh, the, the speech of fluent speakers speaking at a reasonable conversational rate such as the one I'm currently using right now. Um, once I had determined the, the fluency points that they would get for their own very natural speech in their native language, I could determine for myself what, according to my system, relative oral fluency corresponded to. For me, it meant, as I said, 25 fluency points um, uh, per minute over a period of a minimum of two minutes. And um, you notice that I call it relative oral fluency. This is because, of course, I'm talking about fluency within the limitations of the specific vocabulary and grammatical structures of which the students have been made aware and in which they've been trained, of course. And because I wanted their speech as well to be coherent, I tempered this score by means of a, a deduction for structural errors in their speech. And I determined that they had to speak, as I said, at le with at least 25 fluency points per minute for two minutes, and they needed to maintain a score, overall score of at least 80%. And you can look at my particular uh, system to see how I come up with a percentage for their, their, uh, for their presentation at the end of their presentation. Once the students have attained that particular level of fluency, uh, I determine that, that they are ready to move into phonics instruction and reading because I have the confidence that they're thinking in the target language and they're speaking in a two-step thought process. So this is employing the speech transcription method that I created. You come up with something on your own which may be entirely different. The key is that it must be something that allows you to discern that key threshold moment where, or the, the watershed moment, where the student is no longer thinking in their native language, but is thinking in the target language. The topic of the fourth and the last video that I'd, li I'd like to uh, share with you, um, let me put it this way. I don't know what life is like in your particular part of the country or the world. However, here where I live, in, in uh, the north of the United States, in Michigan, along about the month of February, Students are at their lowest ebb as far as their energy and enthusiasm levels concerned because all of us are suffering from the seemingly interminable uh, winter months when we can't go outside, we're experiencing cabin fever. And students' posture tends to communicate to you in class that uh, they've had enough. They're kind of fed up. And, and they almost sit back and, and by their body, their posture, their body language, they say to you, come on, teach me. I dare you. Well, that's a, that's a terrible kind of a situation to get into. And we need to have tools that allow us to, uh, to uh, uh, generate enthusiasm and interest in our students, even in those lowest moments of the, of the school year. And that's what will be the topic of the last uh, video in this series. Um, there is a tool that I, uh, we have at our disposal as world language instructors, which I think is the most critical tool uh, for us to employ if our students ha are going to have a chance of attaining uh, a fluent level of speech. Um, so I'd like to make that the topic of the next video, and I sincerely hope that you will be able to join me. In fact, I dare you. See you soon.